quickly checked the uh, press, the media from the 50s, 60s, and 70s in relation to the topics of my interest, that is the cultural politics. So I prepared about 60 slides. Of course, the problem is that they're all in Serbo-Croatian or Slovenian, and I put a short abstract in English for you to understand. But uh, the first, uh, I put the slideshow, but on the first one, you can see Zdenka was saying, the, uh, the highway of brotherhood and unity, well, it passed actually, but it was, uh, it was on that image next time when it uh, shows you can see it. Okay, so you can see it, right? You can also see the translation. Maybe it's a bit fast, but I don't know how to do it differently. So, self-management. Um, uh -huh. In order to discuss uh, the commons, today, especially in relation to art and culture, um, it's also important to speak from our particular location, from our geopolitical experience, uh, to a reference to what Miglena said, um, what form can the common take? So in order to do that, we must return at least 60 years back to the 1950s. That's a period when Yugoslavia broke with the Soviet Union after it refused to submit to the Soviet domination, which left it in cultural, political, economic isolation from the rest of the socialist bloc. And this also meant that the Ajit Prop Department, which until then controlled basically all cultural happenings in Yugoslavia, was abolished. And Ajit Prop was something that took after the Soviet model, and it was controlled by the Yugoslav Communist Party. And subsequently, all these changes, they led to the development of a new kind of state cultural politics, the one based on self-management, and also later on, on the non-aligned movement, as Jelena and some of you uh, mentioned. However, the liberations on the socialist cultural politics might sound anachronistic or even conservative today, especially if observed in the light of current museological discourses on the so-called new prototypes of art institutions, users of art, educational turn, participation in art, and so on. And in addition to all these categories, the very notion of working class, as was mentioned a couple times today, which represented the most important part of the self-management system had also become obsolete, also especially due to the fact that in most, um, uh, in most of the Western world, immaterial labor has to a large extent replaced industrial work. Compared to the now historical proletariat, the contemporary cognitariat does not constitute a class. So seen in this slide, the socialist self-managed museums, their governance and the content which such museums provided could only be considered today as conservative, subordinated to the state, ideologically restricted, highly bureaucratized by favoring conventional art formants, didactic means of providing knowledge about art and so on. But on another level, you know, there's many questions related to that. Can we still even consider the question of class struggle? back to Carlos' argument, and class struggle-related antagonism within the art institutions nowadays, as used to be the case in Yugoslavia. And what about the dichotomy between elitism, intellectual elitism included, and social and political engagement in such institution, or to put it in terms of a more modern vocabulary? How does the process of commoning happen within the cultural field today? So in order to answer some of these dilemmas, I would attempt to link some, let's say, progressive socialist cultural policies, museum models and directions, as well as their emancipatory utopias, to today's deliberation on the new prototypes of art institution, or what is also called radical museology. So it's not a coincidence that in many uh, socialist countries, around the world, art and politics were united in their quest for creating utopian models adapted to social and political changes, especially in the 60s and 70s. And experimental museology and concepts such as integrated museum, social museum, living museum, museum of the workers, were widely discussed in the so-called global south. And progressive cultural politics considered culture and art as commons, something that belonged to all, and at least that was the case in theory. 
So now let's return to Yugoslavia. As a consequence of all the political events and specific economic climate in Yugoslavia in the early 50s, self-management was introduced. Even though some writers have identified the origin of this kind of uh, self-management already in the Second World War, anti-fascist committees. The main ideologue of self-management was Edvard Kandel, and it was promoted by economists like Branko Horvat, theoreticians like Darko Suvin, Rudi Supek, and others. Of course, the, the important thing is this, these people did not only affirm self-management uh, principles, but they were also critical towards self-management. Self-management had a profound influence on the society as a whole. It introduced a new type of managing labor organizations, the working people participation in decision making and workers' councils. Self-management brought about increased autonomy of production economic unit, which was a step forward from the plant economy as practiced in the Soviet Union, as it handed the factories to the workers. And this, was, this process was a process towards the withering of the state. Workers officially manage the socially uh, owned means of production, and this uh, complex set of relations was called associative labor. Maybe you noticed here in some of the texts this notion of associative labor and culture. Self-management uh, was also intru uh, introduced in cultural institution when it was called social management, with museum workers, council, later on with the delegate system, which was a collective body consisting of a third of its members who were the representatives of the employees, and two-thirds who were exter external members, and represented its so-called social interest in the activities in the institution. And the basic idea was that those producing and those consuming culture jointly decide on matter of importance for the institutions, that is financial plan, annual accounts, the work program, and so on. Stanley Dolanz, who was a high-ranked Yugoslav Communist Party official, said in his speech in Moderna Galleria in 73, the new position of culture in socialist self-management destroys the historic wall between the working masses and the culture. And that's the end of the quote. And this new vision also produced a change in the interpretation of culture. Culture was not any more considered as artistic expression per se, that is painting, sculpting, and so on, but included all types of creative manifestation physical labor, politics, social life, education, science, etc. So culture was less and less treated as a sector and more and more as an integral part of the overall creative effort of society, a link providing interaction between intellectual and physical labor. And this old so-called statist culture was to be replaced with so-called socialized culture. And I'm not, um, actually I checked quite many documents on the cultural politics and self-management and uh, this information that I'm telling you now is from the UNESCO report from 1980s written by Stevan Majstorovic and it's called Cultural Politics and Self-Management in Yugoslavia. Well, we can even say that in this specific way, the 1950s uh, were a period of cultural blossoming in the former Yugoslavia. And for example, there was a formal status of freelance uh, ugh, technical problems. Uh, the formal status of freelance cultural worker was introduced, including all social benefits. And then significant part of the national budget went towards numerous cultural activities. And then modernism was introduced as the favorite style, and med modernist works were sent to biennials already in the 50s all over the world. And cultural infrastructure, including museums, was to be built or reconstructed. And some of the main concerns of Yugoslav cultural policy at that time, for example, including culture in the entire socio-economic context and transforming citizens from passive users into co active co-creators of culture, which is definitely something that could be observed today in the context of the commons, as I already mentioned. And the goal was that art also uh, how it was called, top level or high, uh, high art, and culture were to be accessible to all. The idea behind was to teach citizens and workers how to manage their country better. And s such, for example, were organizing didactic exhibitions. 
already in 1952 in Moderna Galleria there was a, a series of exhibition on on French painting from Impressionism on but because of course they didn't have the original works they uh, used color reproductions with lecture by prominent art historians and so on and there were also many other didactic exhibitions and um, of course they were also workers universities that sprung all over Yugoslavia and these workers universities also provided courses for workers on art and art appreciation and this is one of the booklets from the early 60s that deals with this topic published by the workers university. Uh, these cultural practices took many different forms and you can see some of these forms here in the background including, for example, amateur cinema and photo clubs, which were established in factories and other worker organizations. And they provided opportunities for avant-garde experimenting in the spirit of socialist self-management. And this is really a special case because it's a, a bit similar to the uh, Soviet prolet cult from 1917, because in this way certain links were maintained between the so-called high culture and the workers. And if workers didn't come to the museum and galleries, then artists and museum workers would go to the factories. In museums in, of modern contemporary art in Yugoslavia, especially since 1970s, art was brought from the museums to factories to workers' association, where special seminars on modern art were conducting. And one such widely recognized program was called Forma Viva, a sort of artist in residence program where artists were temporarily working in various factories and in exchange for the material, they would in return leave their works to the factories. For instance, Pannonia Agricultural Complex in Vojvodina, they had their own cultural center with studio for painters. And then Podravka Food Industry or Leg Pharmaceutical Industry, they have opened art galleries. And then the steel works, in CISAC or Steelwork Factory, Ravne and Koroshkem have established collaboration of artists with workers uh, on jointly creating artworks. And of course, there are many, many more examples like this. And the idea was to transform all forms of human labor into a creative activity. And this particular direction was known as culture of work or work as culture. But what is also interesting that at that time, perhaps we had two different understanding of the idea of the commons in culture. And the first one is this official one that I'm telling you now, linking self-management with culture, opening the museums to working people, educational levels of population, etc. And this direction included the workers as an important part of the process of the commoning, where an emphasis was put on the so-called socialization of culture, and the slogan was culture to the people. But then we had this other understanding of the commons and it's this alternative or more utopic one, the one which included, for example, the 1960s neo-avant-garde collectives where art was to become life belonging to everyone in a process of democratization of the artistic production and reception or alternatives of the 80s which were very much connected to the wider and political movements of that time in Yugoslavia. Uh, actually, many art collectives were organized on something that from today's perspective could be seen as the principle of self-management. And this is in the sense of Massimo De Angelis who said, whatever is produced in the common must stay in the common. So paradoxically, since there was no art market for those works of art, art was in a way emancipated from various regimes, let's say, and the artist able to create without the interfering interest of the state or art market, so art could stay in the common. Well, there are many uh, also negative sides of self-management, uh, high level of bureaucratization. It was a very complicated system with committees, assemblies, interest communities, chambers, established for basically everything, demanding too much time from workers who had to engage in various tasks for which they were not competent. Also, conflicts between artistic missions and collective management of the institution were inevitable. And it has been said by some authors that the introduction of self-management in culture only meant to break away uh, cultural, uh, to break cultural nationalism down into harmless units and to reduce the danger of elitism and cultural centralism. And there was also a huge gap between an even economic cultural development in various parts of Yugoslavia, especially in North and South Division. As a consequence, the so-called demetropolization of culture happened in the 70s with houses of culture being built in the countryside all over the Yugoslavia, stimulating and favoring amateur art production. 
Also opposition to socialist system, even in the form of irony, was often sanctioned. For example, many black wave films were banned, film directors not allowed to film. Writers were occasionally accused of being either bourgeois or enemies of socialism, such as the case of Boris Del Pekic, for those of you who know him, and could not publish their works anymore and so on. So, but many artists actually commented that it was basically possible to do almost any kind of artistic experiment during the time of socialism with two exceptions, criticizing President Tito and the Yugoslav army. Um, also, they were um, in, the, in the artistic circles, there were some attempts of some slight criticism, but mostly these were bureaucratical principles in self-management, that that's the case of October 75 from a Student Cultural Center in Belgrade, of which Sezgin will say some more words, so I will not. But, however, there was one kind of criticism that was not tolerated well, and that's criticism of the left, which came from the left itself. And there was, for example, famous Praxis School of Philosophy in Korčula Summer School, or Faculty of Philosophy in Belgrade, which experienced quite uh, repressive measures and political pressures on them uh, from the League of Communists. And I have here, well, somewhere, also a text written by Noam Chomsky, who he wrote in support of all these people who were accused of, very, of being enemies of socialism and so on. So at the end, this model, self-management, self failed to be part of the actual worker struggle. And there are many arguments why it did happen, but I don't know if I have time. And it's mostly... Um, because of economic crisis in Yugoslavia, huge foreign debt, involvement on international monetary fund, bureaucratization, speedy marketization, unequal economic development, and so on and so on. We can talk about this later on. But uh, regardless, this system was, as many authors, many people agree, the most comprehensive long-term attempt in history to establish popular self-government. Well, there are important issues, of course, to be learned from Yugoslav self-management self project, not only to resurrect some forgotten traditions, cultural practices, but also some kind of alternative to prevailing, uh, let's say, Western cultural model. Um, looking back at what happened in the 90s, it's quite obvious that museums in the former socialist countries of Eastern Europe integrated into the global art system, adapting to a lesser or greater degree the Western, art, the Western canon of art history, Western culture model, the subsequently the, the logic of capitalism. So we are not interested today in the repetition of the old ideas, but rather to consider self-management as a possible counter model to think about new, uh, new commons, or as Carlos says, production of social semiotics. And this could possibly be done on three levels. Of course, we don't, I don't, we don't have time to go into detail, but on the level of institutional organize, organization, on the level of knowledge production, and on the level of heritage. And I will only, for those of you who are interested and have um, perhaps, yeah, there are some books, actually there are quite many books on self-management, still exist, you can find them on flea markets, and I have here some, uh, some, um, some how this is called, uh, ideogram, how self-management actually functions, so that's for me. <laughs>